Javier is from Florida and in says in the notes, when examining one religious one's religious beliefs, is it better to start from a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach? Example being top-down, um, starting with Christian doctrine and then kind of exploring everything out of that, or um, is a God necessary to even have these conversations? Does that sound about right, Javier? Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Um, look at that. I was able to multitask. I've got you <laughs> queued up. Um, how's it going? Going pretty well, pretty well. Um, I'm just about going to be done with my, uh, my college semester, which is nice. Nice. Congrats. And, uh, That's awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice to see you guys got a new a new furry friend with you. I'm more of a dog person myself, but I'm also a mammal enthusiast. So there you go. <laughs> anything with fur is fine by me. I, I grew up with dogs, um, but uh, Georgie has quickly become my favorite thing. Um, and she does. Other than you. I feel course. like she's... Um, well, thank you. <laughs> um, I grew up with dogs, but V's fine too, I guess, is, is the takeaway there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the reason that we were excited when you called last week about this is because a lot of people kind of take for granted how you're supposed to approach your ideas. And so we'd love to kind of get your take on it and then go from there. All right, then. So I won't, uh, I won't bore you with my, with my life story, but just to give a little bit of context on how I began this um, evaluation is a what I refer to as top down, you know, starting with specific Christian um, things, particularly beginning with uh, the Bible, because uh, I uh, I'm a you know I may be in Florida right now, but I am Puerto Rican, and uh, back in Puerto Rico, you know, my whole life, uh, like I mentioned, my parents are religious, and I you know was going to church every sun Sunday, sure. going to a religious school, yada yada yada, you know, not really having any any sort of uh, opposing uh, viewpoint on religion. Right. And uh, yeah, and also as a side, as a side note, I don't know if, if y'all have ever been to a Puerto Rican church, but they are the loudest churches you will ever find. <laughs> Very, I, I don't think I've ever. I have no. been to a uh, Baptist church in the Caribbean, and I doubt that it was louder than that. <laughs> just the the, the, right. the sheer okay. like power of those speakers like nobody was shy about it it was, <laughs> it was pretty good okay all right all right um but yeah so my first time i guess uh not necessarily considering it because of course i already had some conflicts with the with the you know the genesis one stories because biology is my whole favorite thing and of course i know that is very much not possible but the first time like seriously evaluating it was one time in a bible class in my school where we were um, reading i believe it was the book of john mm -hmm. and i got bored so i decided to read ahead to the book of acts and it was the thing where the, the two conflicting stories of how judas died and how the field of blood or whatever it was called got its name right Oh yeah. yeah, and so, so I, I raised my hand. You know, I asked, I asked the teacher, um, "Hey, hey, what about this? It looks like there's two two conflicting stories here." And the answer I got, I, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was unsatisfactory to say the least. Uh -huh. And that sort of, I guess, I guess planted the seed that would be watered years later, because my current um, state of evaluating my religious beliefs is uh, beginning with the Bible, and uh, basically, I thought to myself, you know. The Bible was compiled by a bunch of people, I, I don't know if they were Catholics or, or whatever, but they were compiled by a bunch of people a long time ago, and they ha they decided what books are Scripture, what books are not, and how exactly did they do that? And on top of that, how do I know that that the, the books that they chose to begin with are reliable? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. This so, yeah, so that is the... Yeah, this all sounds almost exactly like what I kind of had to deal with when I was first kind of encountering all of this at my Christian college. Um, I was required to take uh, theology classes and Bible history classes and some just general, uh, you know, Christian oriented classes about spirituality and prayer and, and community service and all of that. And I had access to some really smart people who were very well read on the subject. 
And nobody was answering the questions in a satisfactory way, right? There was always that little bit of a, oh, I'm sure there's a good reason for this. I'm just too stupid to realize what it is. Let me go ask the smart professor who knows all the things and writes on the blackboard, hey, what do you think about this? And then it was just this letdown of, oh, you don't know either. And that's code for stop asking questions. You have to have faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or or on the other end of it, um, you know, somebody will let loose this huge esoteric diatribe um, with language that you don't have a lot of experience with, and it just like goes over your head. Esoteric and diatribe. Yes, <laughs> yes, and and you you wind up sitting there going, "Oh, there is an answer. I'm just too dumb for it." Um, yeah, which which is a real bummer. Um, it, it it it's it's interesting, you know especially coming from that background that you would think, hey, well, I'm going to start with what I know and start mm -hmm. start with the Bible. And that's what a lot of Christians will do. Um, what kind of started rattling that for me was a um, an interpretation that I'd heard. Um, and it wasn't even like, you know, atheist or anything like that. It was just somebody putting context to the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm and talking about how if you understood the politics of the time <clears throat> it was incredibly clear what was being talked about yeah it was it was the specific political situation of the area and how everything was being referenced would be incredibly obvious to anybody who was there um, but since it's been so long if you don't understand that context people start turning it into other things and all of these beasts of the sea and and, and, and all of this and the crowns, um, you know, people will look at it and, and, and create monsters, but it's just a misunderstanding of a political well, thing Well, I like to think on. of it like, you know those like political cartoons like Ben Garrison? If you didn't know like what the U.S. code for Republicans and Democrats were in however many thousands of years, you'd look back and be like, oh, the ancient... U.S. Uh, culture believed in an, in an enormous elephant and an they, enormous donkey, and they worshipped and they them. Just, you know, were were like battling in the sky or whatever. And no, of course not, right? That's not anything like what we're doing. But because of the language of politics and that evocative kind of metaphorical language, it can get misinterpreted if you do, if you don't have the context. But here's the here's the the rub. If you don't start from a biblical understanding of things and try and build your way towards it, you can never get there. And that's that that is really damning and really, really hard to handle. And so if you're kind of just working through it, I would recommend taking things a piece at a time. You know, if you are working through a certain bit of scripture and you're like, I'm starting to question this look into it and if you find that you are going down a rabbit trail follow that rabbit trail the more you learn the better you're going to be able to move on to the next thing you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah i i see what you mean um but something that i am uh, curious about at least from your perspective yeah is uh um so um, i already told you you know my, my sort of story about it but at the same time when i was uh, when i was thinking about that um, kind of like the the conversation we had um, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It was like um, evaluation of a more like um, things specific to any one religion would ultimately be unnecessary if by evaluating the fundamentals of you know uh, the potential existence of a deity or deities, if that was found to be um, not true or impossible, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of like efficiency, which one of those do you think would be more efficient? Oh, that's a good question. Definitely. Um, so you kind of, I, I would recommend um, not going with hard and fast rules um, because often you're going to find yourself cutting off your nose to spite your face. Um, but often Occam's razor is the way to go. You know, the answer with the least assumptions is going to be more often than not the right answer. Um, that said, there are complex things in the world around us. Um, but the time to understand and, and, and accept those complex things is when it's demonstrated, you know? So just take it with a grain of salt. I wish that it was more black and white, but really the answers are shades of gray. I'm going to go more black and white than that. Go for it. I don't think you can start from 
a bottom up approach, if that makes sense. Because every single person has their own assumptions about every single piece of whatever they're talking about, whether or not it's subconscious or conscious, whether they believe in a thing or very much don't and have ideas about it from, you know, critiquing it. It's really difficult to actually start from like a blank slate and be like, okay, let's wipe it all away and start building the foundation all over again because you're bringing your biases, everybody does this, to the table. So there are going to be things that seem like an Occam's razor solution. Oh yeah, if I say God created the universe, then that is a single a single uh, piece, of, piece of information. And it is much less complicated than something like abiogenesis. <clears throat> but then you have to go back and be like, okay, is this my bias and my understanding of a god making it seem simpler? Let me try breaking that down. And then you go and you start over and over again. So while I, I understand that I also approached all of this from that kind of top-down approach of like, all right, we're going to start with like individual biblical inaccuracies and move from there. And that is an effective way to do it. I don't think it is actually possible to do it the other way unless you are consistently and very, very aggressively rooting out your own biases and heuristics to allow for actual objectivity. Um, and I don't know anybody who has succeeded in that yet, if that makes sense. Hmm. Javier, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, uh, I... I see what you mean. Um, I personally do believe that it is possible for someone to be um, as objective as possible. I don't think uh, I don't think that's a sort of impossible sort of thing. I, I don't think it's the easiest thing in the world. But uh, in my opinion, by just taking nothing for granted, you can uh, sort of achieve that. But when you were saying that, it reminded me of a of a call um, on the show. Uh, about uh, and it has to do with um, when I said taking things for granted. A certain a certain repeat caller who uh, I will not name mentioned that when you're trying to figure out like the fundamentals of something, <clears throat> that uh, ultimately you're going to run into either ac axioms or circular reasoning. And uh, I I found it interesting, but I'm not I'm not quite sure if I agree with that. Even though in a more practical sense. I think that's we all have. I mean, that's what we all have. Like, right. you can take the the logical axioms as axiomatic, or I mean, if you can go circular. Although I think that axi axiomatic um, f fundamentalism, I guess you could call it, is superior because at least axioms are have a, a record of usefulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's a and, and and essentially what what we're talking about here is um, you know he who shall not be named. Uh, saying that presuppositionalism is just as valid as anything else because when you get down to brass tacks, it's all circular. So therefore, their argument is just as valid as ours. And the problem there is that it's looking at it from that kind of black and white perspective, right? Either it's circular or it's not circular. And when we get down to it, if everything is ultimately circular, even if we're going down to those axiomatic laws of logic, then there is no such thing as not circular. And so it doesn't even make sense to have that as a dichotomy because let's look at anything and try and find a non-circular argument if we're going to agree that the laws of logic are that axiom. And when we get down to that, yes, it does become circular. And that is the crisis of consciousness, really. Like that is the thing where when you get down to it and you realize we are always and forever going to be stuck in some kind of subjective loop understanding our reality. And we can do our best to get over that and to, to compensate for it as much as we can by doing things like uh, ascribing to the scientific method and, you know, looking for other people's interpretations and, and, you know, peer review, all of that. But ultimately, there is always going to be some level of this is what we know, we think, and that has to be enough. And that's very, very uncomfortable for people who want that certainty. The problem then becomes saying, well, if everything's circular, then everything is the same. 
And that's not accurate because it is a spectrum, right? It's a zero to 100, right? Zero is, okay, we're all gonna zero out at the laws of logic. We're all gonna agree that these things are required to make sense of anything. We're granting we're it for each other. other. Right, exactly. We're gonna say these are the rules of the game. And then someone else comes in and says, okay, but I'm adding a rule, right? And then we can talk about, okay, does this rule make sense? Can we can we use this rule in a way that accurately predicts reality? No? Okay, well, you are circular, we are circular, but your rule doesn't make sense. It doesn't help us predict reality. Um, I, I just want to give a little bit more info to this for yeah, people absolutely. who want to learn uh, more about this and kind of dive into it. Um, if people are wondering what the hell are they talking about, how can I learn more about it, um, try looking up the problem of induction. Um, essentially, your law, the laws of logic. It's when your stove doesn't work. No. No, that's another <laughs> kind of induction. Um, <laughs> that was pretty good, though. Uh, the so the laws of logic say that a thing is what it is, isn't what it isn't, and can't be what it is and what it isn't at the same time. Those are the that's the bedrock upon which logic rests. But if you ask somebody, how do you justify that? Well. The laws of logic support the laws of logic, um, but if you're using something to support it to justify itself, um, that is circular. And so it's 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 a problem that we all have. Um, but you know, for people who kind of want to have a little bit more access to this conversation, that's yeah, that's that is where we start. Um, so I, I guess the next question is: if we are allowing each other the ability to use logic, if we're granting that so we can have a conversation, how many other things do we need to grant? What's necessary to be granted in order to have that conversation? And you know, I, um, I think that there are quite a few things, and I think that they're justifiable. Um, I would argue that treating the other person as if they are interacting honestly with you, we ought to do that. We ought to assume that the other person is knowledgeable to some degree and not talk down to them or be condescending to them. Um, we should ask questions. And even if something seems silly, we should give people the benefit of the doubt until they no longer deserve the benefit of the doubt. You know, those things are, I think, we should do because I want to have productive conversations. Now, what if I said, Javier, um, I also want you to grant me before we start that I win? <laughs> Um, are you, are you, are you going to grant that? No, but that's mostly because I'm a sore loser. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or I, 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 I want you to grant before we start that I'm right. Um, so, okay. Before we start, I'm right. Um, okay. I'm right, obviously. Um, and then, you know, you, 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 you say, well, what's the use of that? And I go, oh, well, you're circular when it comes to the laws of logic. Well, Actually, both of us are granting that for each other. And so the decision to rescind um, accepting that for another person, right? The idea you have no access to the laws of logic uh, is what presuppositional apologists will do or what presuppositional apologetics is about. Um, it, it seeks to shut down the conversation by invalidating the interlocutor. And if that's what you're doing, then obviously you don't want to have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, pre presupposi presuppositional apologia. I mean, I, I like to call it an assertion wearing an argument disguise. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. I, I, I personally call it the argument from Ali Ali Oxenfree. <laughs> Yeah, I, re I remember back. Um, it was when you you were on an episode of the Atheist Experience, and and the guy just kept he just kept saying, "Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you're you're just borrowing from my worldview because, like, to even understand that, you just need, you need to already accept my worldview, man." I remember that call. <laughs> that was you and Christy, I think. I think so. Yeah. Oh man, Christy, Christy was on fire that episode. I that was, was so a lot impressed. I was like, my two co-hosts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you guys. Um, it was a good time, Javier. Uh, Honestly, I love these conversations with you. I think that we are getting into some really kind of uh, heady areas. How are you feeling about all of this? Are we giving you things you've already kind of heard before? Are, are we bringing something new to the table? What kind of what kind of things are you hoping for out of this? 
Oh yeah, you, you are bringing some some new things to the table, and and uh, you know I'm all, I'm always in in pursuit of you know new knowledge and way, ways to to think of uh, things. Uh, in terms of what I uh, what I'm getting out of this, well, you know, yeah, yeah, what I said, just new ways to think about things, new tools, I guess, to add to my to my toolbox in mm-hmm. terms of evaluating um, what I believe and uh, hopefully evaluating uh, more things in the future. I um, love that. And also, it's just it's also just fun, you know. I, I find these sort <laughs> of uh, conversations to be interesting, and I, I you know I like keeping conversations like this going. So um, before I uh, before I um, just uh, you know give give you all a rest from my annoying voice, um, you're I'll say so that, uh, What's up? Yeah, this will uh, be the last time I I call in for for quite a bit. Because like I said, I'm a gradu- I'll be graduating soon, and so I'll be moving back for a bit with some uh, my religious family members. Got it. And I don't want to cause. Yeah, it, w- it would be causing a lot of trouble. The unnecessary trouble if, uh, you know, like what you're calling into an atheist talk show, yeah. or, or, you know, <laughs> you could so, just uh, tell them that you're evangelizing to us and we're listening and you need to get on next week to like keep it going. <laughs> I, I, I actually yeah. happen to know uh, a pastor or two who uh, use that as bragging rights that they're friends with atheists. <laughs> Apologists, <laughs> but yeah. Bottom line is we don't want to lose you, but we totally understand if this is something that is going to take a break for a while. Yeah, and we're glad that you're questioning and questioning vocally so that other people who are exploring these ideas can have a safe place to interact with them. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, well, it's, it's been it's been nice talking to you guys. Um, hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> you Bye. Too. Take care. Aw. Javier is very sweet. Yeah, I really hope that uh, the family situation is something that's okay. Because I know that like when I had to move back to my family after all of that for a little bit, it was, <clears throat> it was a little rough. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we're thinking about you, man. Yeah. 